Hey. Hey, hey we did it. Oh, I'm not. Hey, guys. Sure. We're live. <laughs> We're live. Hey, uh, uh, yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, so we are some of Cloud Air Fast Forward. Um, we're glad you've come to hang out with us today. So I'm Chris, hey, uh, and I'm joined by, on either my left or right, I'm never going to get this right, but Melanie. Sorry, <laughs> Melanie. Hi, I'm Melanie. I'm on, well, whatever side of Chris. <laughs> uh, I'm Abby. Hard. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm on the other side of Chris. How is it going with you two today? Yeah, how is YouTube today? No, with you two, with both of oh, you. Oh, with how are each of you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's going great for me. It's actually sunny today here in Minneapolis where, where I'm at, um, which hasn't been the case. It's been rain, 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 which makes my dog very upset because he's a little baby about water. So he actually got a chance to go for a walk today and he might get a second one today if he's lucky and the sun holds. Nice. Wow. Uh, I, I went for a walk at lunch and it made me really happy. There's something about <laughs> sun that just it's all those vitamin b's or yeah. k's or sun stuff we actually hit 80 um, degrees here yesterday which is what yeah it went from about 55 to 88 so or not 88 80 degrees <laughs> sorry you just like skipped over spring and and went straight into summer just like boom that's how it goes here in maryland <laughs> so we're, Maryland effect. <laughs> we're spanning, I was going to say six time zones, it's three time zones, but six hours. Uh, six tell us where you're from. Tell us in the chat where you're tuning in from. Uh, so like a classic conference question where, you know, you ask like, hey, who's traveled the furthest? And, and on the internet, it's going to be like wild because, you know, there yeah. are people from anywhere. So, <laughs> um, and Chris, you didn't say from. where you were from. So we Oh, know. yeah. I'm, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm way up north in, in England, uh, in Newcastle. Uh, what my colleagues like to refer to is North London, but it would be like super North <laughs> London because it's like a couple hundred miles. I don't think I've ever <laughs> said that to you ever. <laughs> it's Victor. It's mostly Victor. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's all cool. Victor. Um, so while you're like saying hey and telling us where you're from, uh, let's talk about what we're actually going to talk about. So Melanie is kind of the star of today's show. She released some research uh, out of our lab uh, back end of last year about few shot text classification. Um, and uh, I kind of struggled with it when we were first starting. There were some like conceptual things I had to get my head around. Uh, so I'm going to buddy along with her, and we're going to talk through uh, what it is and when it's useful. Um, Andrew's here because he's done one of these before, and we wanted someone to hold our hands. Yeah. Uh, and he's he's going to moderate the chat and uh, QA at the end. So um, Andrew's an excellent that... hand holder. Moral yeah. support. Moral support <laughs> is awesome. important. <laughs> um, so let's uh, before we get on to uh, actually talking tech uh, and giving demos and stuff. Um, let me tell me you just a little bit about FFL and how you can win some socks. <laughs> so if we <laughs> <laughs> let's bring up the um, bring up the screen. Hey, there's a screen. Cool. And say goodbye to Andrew for the time being. Um, yeah, we'll come back to Andrew. <laughs> so we are Cloud Air Fast Forward Labs. Um, we are some of Cloud Fast Forward Labs. And our mission is to make the recently possible useful. So we stay up to date on the latest research developments from both industry and academia in data science and machine learning and related technologies. Um, and we try and bridge the gap to products and processes that are actually useful to people, um, specifically practitioners, but also kind of uh, business leaders in the same areas. Uh, and we do that mostly by building stuff. So we like to get our hands on technology and like see what's useful and what works and like what's just hype and isn't ready for prime time yet and like actually try and work this stuff out. Uh, and then once we've built stuff, we write about it. Um, and we, when we write about it, we uh, release that writing for the, to the public for free. You can check it out at the links there. Um, there'll be a bunch more links dropped in the chat uh, where you can see uh, where you can go and access this stuff for free. Um, so we work really hard on, on trying to make this stuff digestible and, and useful to you. Uh, but do like check it out and tell us what you think. Um, you can even tell us what you think live. And while we go through this, you can ask questions. Uh, and if you ask a question, uh, it, we will we'll do our best to answer it in the Q&A at the end. Um, and if you hang around for that Q&A and you're here at the end 
of the, the, the live stream, uh, you can win a swag voucher. So we have two $20 swag vouchers to give away. Uh, $20 gets you two pairs of socks. We're really excited, unreasonably excited about the socks. In the <laughs> um, it's perfectly yeah. reasonable. Socks are great. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, or you could throw in some of your own 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 dollar if you like and get like there's some really nice stuff. I took a look at the store today. It's like a Fjall Raven backpack. Um, I feel like I'm going to do all my shopping on the the Cloud Era, you know, site now. Just like buy everything. <laughs> so ask us a question about learning with uh, about few shot text classification and uh, stick around. We will try and answer it, and you can win some swag. Cool. Uh, let's talk about machine learning, then. That's what we do. It is what so, we do. Melanie, over to you. Tell me about few-shot text classification. All right. I think I can do that. So few-shot text classification. Um, before we get super into the weeds, I want to start with kind of a high level of what you guys can all expect over the next half hour. Um, and so I'm going to start with a really brief primer, just kind of introduce it. We'll get our feet wet. You know, We'll dip our toes in. Um, and then we're going to actually jump right into a demo right away, which I think is going to be super fun and exciting. Um, and then once we've seen some of the demo, then we'll start unpacking it. And we'll start looking at what goes into the behind the scenes of how that demo works and what are the techniques and models that we're using to make it make it do. And then finally, we're going to wrap up at the end with like some considerations and limitations of this method, because a lot of what we do we don't, we don't like hype unless it's warranted. And so we always are going to tell you, um, when might this not work? And why should you care about that? And then we'll finish up with some Q&A at the end. So to get us started, we need to start at the high level. Why even few shot learning? Um, and for me, this answer is simple and comes in two parts. Because label data is expensive and text classification is ubiquitous. Literally, text classification is one of those super, super basic um, machine learning applications that provides a groundwork for so many other applications that get built on top of it. But labeling data is really hard, time-consuming, costly, expensive. So if we can find ways to, to do that with fewer labels, then that would be a win. That's a big win. So we're going to talk about some different regimes. Um, and we need to do some, some definitions here, because I'm going to be throwing out some terms. And I want to make sure we're all on the same page. <clears throat> so when you're talking about trying to do machine learning in a limited labeled data regime, do not try saying that three times fast. Um, there's a couple of different subcategories that we're going to be talking about. And so I want to just lay the groundwork here with some definitions. So this whole thing is called few shot learning, but that's really just a subset of this limited labeled data regime of machine learning. Um, and few shot learning is when we want to, uh, we have a small amount of labeled data for all of the labels that our classifier is supposed to recognize. So it might not be a lot, but we have a few for every single label and we know what all the labels are. Zero shot learning, we won't actually go into it today, but I wanna define it here still. Zero shot learning is traditionally where we're going to take a classifier, train it on one set of labels with sufficient examples, but then apply it um, to a different set of labels that it's never, ever seen before. So that's the zero shot part. And then there's what I'm going to call on the fly learning. And this one's really cool because this is classification with no training examples at all and an undetermined number of labels. So today I'm going to talk about a technique that can actually work in all three of these regimes. But how, you might ask? Uh, but how? But how? Good question, Chris. <laughs> the how is by using the semantic meaning of words themselves, by leveraging the intrinsic information of words and their meanings. And like Chris, you and I do this every single day. I'm pretty sure that we know how words work and we can understand the meaning. So if we're reading an article about baseball, without being shown a bunch of examples, we know right off the bat that that is probably sports and it's a sports category. Pretty simple stuff. Turns out there are actually some machine learning um, techniques that can do something quite similar. 
And that's what we're going to leverage today. So at a high level, what is this, uh, what will this take? It's going to take something called an embedding model. And you've probably all heard about these now. Um, they're pretty popular and they're continuing to gain popularity. And the idea here is that we're going to take the articles that we want to classify, like our baseball um, article, and we're going to take all the possible labels that it might be categorized into. We're going to pass all of them into an embedding model. And then we're going to look at the resulting embeddings in an embedding space, which looks like this. And we're essentially going to look for the label that's closest to our article in that space. This is like, I remember the first time you explained this to me, I thought it was wild because you actually rely on what the label means. Like I'm used to thinking like labels are categories and it's like one zero, one, you know, one hot encoding or something. But you actually care what the, the, the label means. And it made a ton more sense once I kind of realized that what we've essentially done is turn classification into similarity search. Exactly. Yep. And that's all we're going to do here. So let's see it in action now. I'm going to jump to the demo. We're going to play around with that. Uh, boop. There it is. Wow. That was slick. <laughs> Super slick. Hooray tabs. <laughs> so this demo, um, it's actually, you can find it on our GitHub repo. I think there, there are going to be some links in the chat. So this is a simple Streamlit application that um, we created. And, uh, and it kind of can walk through, we're going to walk through some of the features that it has. At its core, um, I have a few examples. Whoa, where's my mouse? Hello, mouse. There we are. I have a few different examples here that you can choose from, although I've selected one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, these examples come from a data set called the AG News data set. Very, very classic data set for text classification. And I picked this particular um, uh, example because in a past life, I was an astrophysicist. So I like things about supernovas and stuff. So we have the text of the article here. And then below that are a bunch of different labels that we might want to classify this text into. World, sports, business, sci-tech, et cetera. Did I, did I, no, okay, there we go. And underneath that, we can see that the model, I've already run this, so it's already outputting what it thinks is the best label. And right now it's saying that SciTech is the label that's closest to this article, which is great. But it turns out we can actually augment this on the fly. This is the on the fly part. And I might say, you know, actually I want to have astronomy as a potential category. Chris, would you like to offer some additional categories for classification here? Yeah, because I think yesterday. Uh, no, Chris would when not. I gave this Cool. Yes, I would. Oh, I what? Ah. Can oops. you unmute me? Hey. Might have. I would. There we go. Now it's kind of running. Awesome. Uh, so I did it. I don't know why it's looking a little funky you know, technical difficulties, but it did put astronomy there as the highest one, right? So this article is very, very definitely astronomy, which is great. Um, and that's exactly what we would expect. And so the great part about this is this on the fly, it's super, super flexible. Uh, yeah, I cannot, I think we lost Chris. I'm just gonna keep going. Chris will find his way back. Um, but. We can also throw in a bunch of other labels, like maybe wedding is a category, or maybe um, cooking might be another category we care about. And we can go ahead and run this again. And it's thinking, it's thinking, and still astronomy comes out the winner, which is great because it would be weird if like cooking came out the winner for this article about supernovas. Um, cool. So that's kind of the demo. And now we're going to go ahead and unpack some of these concepts. Um, how is it actually doing this? And, and what is going on behind the scenes? Ooh, we might have Chris again soon. So stay tuned for that. Chris is exciting. Uh -uh -uh. Yes. Oh, yeah. That was the thing we just did. Remember that time when I did that demo 30 seconds ago? Very cool. Hey, right. can you hear me now? Yes, Chris is right. back. Okay, cool. uh, I felt so alone. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was shouting out categories for you, like good ones, oh. too, like dinosaur. And, you know, well, you know, we can always go back to the demo again. It was just so easy. Um, in the meantime, 
Uh, we're gonna go under the hood now and look at how we did this on the fly text classification where we just threw in whatever labels we wanted and just ran it up. So I mentioned an embedding model, um, but now it's time to get into the details. Like what was that embedding model? Um, it turns out I'm really a big fan of, of Bert. And this is how I think of Bert in my head is this little blue character. And since this is sentence Bert, I put a nice S on his chest. Sentence Bert is a special version of Bert that's been specifically designed for um, producing embeddings based on their similarity. So it's really optimized to, to get an embedding of an entire sentence and embed that into a, a, an embedding space. And then if there was another sentence that was very similar, you could do cosine similarity on it and it would be like, oh yeah, these two sentences are similar. And that's exactly what we want for this particular problem, right? So I tried this out. I was like, let's just take just sentence bird alone. I'm going to pass it my baseball example and all of these three, these four, three or four different labels. And let's just see how it's going to compare. So here's the results I got. You can see on the left, there's this AG News data set. On the right, I also tried it on some sub, um, some Reddit subreddits. Uh, so I tried it on a couple different data sets. And we can see for our AG News data set, in about 50% accuracy. So like, kind of low. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, in both cases, it seems like we're used to seeing way higher accuracies than that, like as a matter of course, I think in mm -hmm. in general, um, especially on those data sets and such, such canonical data sets. Um, but there's a bunch of good reasons why, uh, which you explained to me yesterday. Yeah, so one of the good, one reason why off the bat is, um, what did I say? <laughs> One of the reasons why is this is just sentence bird, right? And this is, it, there's nothing special going on here. And sentence bird's optimized for sentences. Another thing that makes a difference between these two data sets is there's actually many, many categories in Reddit. I don't know if you've heard of it, but there's a lot. So it's just harder to classify into many categories than with AG News, which is only four categories. Um, yeah. But it turns out we can do better than this, thankfully. But it was like do better. It's an improvement on baseline, right? Like the baseline yeah. here is not 50%. The baseline on Reddit is like, what, 10% if you just did random allocation. If you just say. randomly allocated, yeah. yeah. You'd be getting like so, 10%. You know, another way of looking at this is like we tripled our accuracy with, with no label data. <laughs> no labeled. Yeah, that's right, guys. Like there's nothing labeled here at all. Like it didn't have to do anything, which is pretty cool. Uh, but we can do a little better than this. So like even though this is a decent baseline, it's still maybe not going to be like top notch for any kind of like real world applications. We need to do a little better. And we can do that with some math. Yay, math. This next slide is going to have like so much math on it. Just kidding. It's cute characters. Uh, so in addition to the sentence bird uh, model, which embeds sentences, um, there are many other embedding me methods out there. In fact, there's word to bag, like the OG of text embeddings, right? Like this guy started the craze. Um, and the thing that's really cool about these is that they're optimized for different tasks. So word to bag is optimized for words and it's really good at word similarity. And sentence BERT is obviously optimized for sentences. It would be super cool if we could use word to vec to generate representations for our labels and sentence bird to generate representations for our articles. But there's a catch with that. The problem is they're two different embedding spaces and we can't do cosine similarity anymore on that. There's no, there's no way to connect these two embedding spaces. We need to create a map to go from sentence birds embedding space to word to vex embedding space. And we can do that. So that's cool. And we can do it without labeled data, which is even cooler. The way we're gonna do it is by getting a big collection of words. And we're gonna pass each one of those words through sentence bird, get a representation for each. We'll pass them all through word to vec, get a representation for each. And now we can create a linear transformation between these two spaces because we know what each word looks like in the two different spaces. So that's cool. I'm going to call it a Z map because I'm bad at naming stuff. 
And maybe someone can like throw in the chat, what would be a better name for this? No Mappy McMap faces though. No, no, no. Just come up with something else though. <laughs> All right, so we've learned a Z map. What do we actually do with it once we've learned it? So what we're gonna do, let's go back to our original problem. We had our articles, we had our labels. We passed them all through SentenceBird. Once we do that, we're gonna apply our Z map and transform the SentenceBird representations into words of X space. And then we'll do cosine similarity the same way we did before. Let's look at it another way. Yay, matrices. So we have the, the blue matrix is our sentence for representations and each row is an article. Sentence for representations are 768 elements long. And so that's why you see that's the size of this matrix. The Z map we learned transforms from a sentence for space into words of X space, which is only 300 elements long. And when you multiply those two bad boys together, you get our new representations, and it's those ones that we're gonna do cosine similarity on. So let's see how we did. Hey, look at that. AG News was like, awesome. It did so much better, and we still have used zero labeled data to do it. Um, don't ask me about the Reddit one. There's reasons why. Go check out the report to see why Reddit actually did a little bit worse. You should as well, because actually it, it really helps to understand where these techniques are useful if you like think about the reasons why it fails in certain cases. And there's a yep. lot of thought on that report. Exactly. So there's a lot more on that. I mean, is this going to be the one all method for your one stop shop for everything? Obviously not. There are going to be drawbacks. Um, and Reddit kind of showcases that right here. Um, so uh, everything we've done, like I said, there's been no label data. But what if you have some? Yeah, so that reminds me of, of something. Um, I wish I had a better academic reference, but basically it's a tweet. Right? Uh, <laughs> like I should, I'd, especially a researcher, I should link to a paper. But um, this Richard Socher tweet, uh, he's a NLP researcher that says like, instead of label, like spending a month coming up with some fancy unsupervised method for say text classification, um, just spend a week labeling data. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, but and and like I've given this advice to people before. It's often true. Like folks spend a lot of time going into these super math heavy models, uh, when really what you need is just a bunch of label examples and and, and an easy model with that data might do better. Um, so I wonder if we could, uh, how like how does that gel? We mentioned at the beginning that we're gonna. Uh, incorporate some some label data. So maybe this is like a, a nice segue into the next section. It's like when is you know label data useful? What's the bias here? Yeah, absolutely. So right, like 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 Chris said, honestly, at the end of the day, just go label some data. Um, there's no magic to it. You just need to label some data. But it is still expensive, and sometimes you may only have enough time or money for some. And you want to be able to make the most of the few that you have. And that's still important. And we can do that with this method. <clears throat> so now we're going to get into the few shot part of this. If we have some labeled examples for the, uh, the categories that we care about, we can use this information to drum roll. We're going to get another map. <laughs> Only instead of mapping words between two different embedding spaces, we're going to map the examples to their labels in the same space. And this one is perfectly named WMAP, which I have a hard time saying because it means something very different to me and to Chris. Uh, yeah, ex-physicist <laughs> life. Yeah, exactly. We're, we're both got like physicist, astrophysicist background. Go Google WMAP and like, it's super cool. Anyway, don't do that right now. Do it later afterwards if you want an astronomy physics adventure. For now, the W map here is our represent is our, our matrix that maps between examples that have labels and their labels. And we're going to apply it in succession with the other map we already created. So that's why we have this one here. Once we apply all three of these maps, again, we get a resulting embedding that uh, for each of our articles, and that's what we can do our cosine similarity on. 
So now let's see the final results. Boom, we actually did better on the Reddit data set too. Whoa, whoa, labeled examples work, they help. So now we're actually getting some accuracy on the AG News data set that's pretty decent. And I, I think I only used like 400 labeled examples here, which is not very many. I mean, but yeah, you could do that in like a day. If you are yeah. like, if in your domain, you have the expertise as a practicing data scientist to be able to label the examples, because you might not always like maybe you need an expert labeler or domain expert, but you, you could like spend a day just labeling 400 examples. Yeah, like, easily. Right? Right. And your performance goes through the roof. Yeah, exactly. Like we just drastically increase this by like another 10 to 12 points with just a few hundred examples. So that's where I think the power of this method comes in. It's like super flexible and you can actually get some decent results with just a few labeled examples. Um, but there are some, I mean, we're kind of wrapping up here now. Um, and I do want to talk about like, when, sh when should we use this and when shouldn't we use this? And what should, be th what should we be thinking about if we're going to do this? So let's do some, some considerations and limitations. It sounds very like official, but I am nothing about official. So when would we want to use this? Um, obviously, we only have a few labeled examples, like, ta-da. <laughs> but another way that you might want to use this, and when this can be really handy, is if you need that flexibility, right? So like, if you think that the labels for your example or your use case might change over time, or if you suspect that new labels may be coming in, right? Like if like for the Reddit example, if someone creates a new subreddit and now you want to be able to classify into that, your labels are going to be constantly changing. Um, and so when you need that flexibility, this method can help. But I think one of the coolest possible use cases is like bootstrapping labeled data sets. So you can start by labeling a few. You can use this method to get a handle on what might the other labels, you know, how might all the others in your data set be labeled? Yeah, it's kind of like active learning in that sense, where yeah. you know you could you could use this to dream up some labels, get a bunch of label data set, like get get a label data set, even if the labels aren't that good, um, and then it's quicker to refine those than to do them from scratch, right? You could just yep. check that the label is reasonable. Um, yeah, so. exactly. So there's a lot of ways that this can be handy, but there are definitely some things that you're gonna want to watch out for or be aware of. And the elephant in the room here is I showed you all of these results, right? I was only able to do that because in reality, the AG News data set is already labeled. So I could check to see that the method was working. If you don't have labeled examples, there is literally no way to know how well your model is working. You just have to label some in order to see. Uh, and this is where like going back to Chris's point earlier, like just, take an afternoon and label some, it'll at least give you a starting point. The other thing that we haven't totally talked about here is that the labels have to be meaningful. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning, the semantic meaning of, of words as labels, but it's really important here. If our labels were just zero, one, two, three, four, and those are my you know five buckets to classify into, that has no contextual meaning at all. And this method is not going to work. Um, and then finally, even if you do, um, if you do this, you're, you're not going to get like the best supervised, you know, the best results compared to the supervised methods. So if you have a ton of labeled data, go with a traditional classification approach. Don't use this because it's not going to be as good as that for lots and lots and lots of labeled data. Um, yeah, this is better for when you only have a small amount and you want to make the most of it, like get that punch. Ah, dropping things. Those are all the points I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, should we uh, maybe open it up for some questions? Yeah, do I have a slide for that? I do have a slide for that. Hey. hey. <laughs> Uh, so, so one one question quickly is: uh, folks are asking if it's going to be recorded. Yes, the session will be available. Um, the the replay is available of the live stream on YouTube. So, yeah, for sure. I might even watch it again because I need to see to see how I look on camera. <laughs> oh, Andrew's back! 
Hey guys. Yay. I'm back. <laughs> that was great. Uh, oh, thanks for your impartial review. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was that was great, guys. We have a we have a few questions um, that have come in that I want to bring up now, and one of them actually I echo the same question as well for for both of you guys. Um, in the last slide or the slide before, there was this this question about or there was this point of uh, the labels to do few shot classification need to be meaningful. Um, so I guess my question is, what makes a meaningful label? Like I saw in some the demo that you gave that there was science and technology was actually written out as sci slash tech. Mm -hmm. And the model was actually able to even take that and properly classify something based on that. So yeah. is a meaningful label um, a descriptive adjective? Is it a list of adjectives? What What makes it meaningful? Yeah, and and that's a great question. So that's there's there's a lot to unpack there because again, when we're talking about meaningful labels, like part of it is subjective. It's like, what do these mean to us? Like when I look at SciTech, I I know what that means. I know it's shorthand for science and technology. And I'm actually a little bit surprised that Sentence Bird is also like, oh yeah, I super get that. Yeah. Right. So it it is able, but it might not always be be up to that task. Um, so for example, I was actually trying this out on, um, on a different data set where I wanted to see if I could do semantic, uh, or not semantic, what's that called? Uh, sentiment, there it is, semantic analysis, sentiment analysis. And there, you know, uh, the labels, I, I made words positive, negative, neutral. Um, and it actually did work. I mean, it wasn't great. Um, but that was even enough that I could classify some articles as positive, negative, or neutral. Um, so it really, I think, pays to try to explore that. If your labels are flexible, then you can explore uh, the different space of like what is going to work for your data set. Um, and you can get kind of creative because SentenceBird does take in longer pieces of text, which is more difficult to do with word to vec you have to do some aggregation with the vectors. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a tautology, but like meaningful, it, it, it just means like we'll be close to this, the things you want to find in the embedding space. So like, yeah. um, it doesn't just mean a word, like if you uh, start labeling things, as, not labeling, but if you assign, if you suggest labels of important and unimportant, for instance, like you're not going to find that the articles that you like that you retrieve for each of those labels actually are important or unimportant in any meaningful sense unless they're literally about the concept of importance and unimportance um yeah so, exactly yeah, it's, a, it's a little closer to like a topic than a, a, a label maybe yeah and in, in that case it it makes a lot of sense i think you would phrase it at the very beginning chris as it's more like similarity search than it is like classification yeah. um the, the, the labels themselves have to have to mean something. They have to be semantically related to a concept. It's yeah. not just this is category A or B, which yeah. is a really interesting way to look at the concept of classification. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It's very much similarity search, but then with a classifier hat on top of it. Yeah, and and we were talking uh, yesterday a little bit uh, about extending this. Um, I'm thinking about like, you know, you, you then get all the, you could do all the stuff with it. So like you, because it's just a similarity, you could just report the like closeness of various things instead of like assigning a class. If you really wanted, you could just give some exemplar sentences from each, like that are close to the label or, or uh, you know, give the labels, the multiple labels that are closest to the, the, the query sentence or, um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Right. Like, so you could even do, if you had just a ton of different things and you weren't really sure you could throw in a bunch of different labels and maybe it's a sentence or maybe it's a few words and then you can apply this to all of your articles and take maybe the top three or the top five that are that are most similar um, and then you can kind of get a sense for like what are your articles about maybe i think yeah. Andrew, you're kind of saying it's like inverse lda yeah exactly it's like it can be used as like a discovery technique from the data itself um, and I guess in thinking about it, I guess it could it'd ultimately be best to pair it with LDA, like take a collection of documents, maybe do LDA to discover some some topics, some ideas that might be relevant, and then come up with a, a set of labels for those topics and go and classify them. So I guess in conjunction might be the best way to work with it. 
Yeah, yeah. That I, I kind of like that. I mean, now you're getting like super fun stuff here to me. Like, I'll throw it in this model, and then this model, and then I'll <laughs> the models up. <laughs> yeah, it's menu algebra all the way down there, so you can it's, just do yeah. all of this stuff. Like, it's just linear algebra all the way down. So I guess one one last question I see here. Um, <clears throat> The whole Reddit data set debacle, maybe not, maybe not debacle. <laughs> That's a little harsh. <laughs> what, what is the reason that when we applied the Z map, the Reddit data set accuracy went down, but the AG news went up? Like why, how can we, how can we think about that? How can we justify it? Um, what yeah. makes sense there? Yeah, that's a great question. And like, again, like you can go check out our report for all the nitty gritty details. But at a high level, what it came down to my hypothesis is, again, meaningful labels. So to kind of set the stage, I was working with 10 different subreddits there, right? And some of them were like, relationship advice, politics, fitness. And one of the subreddits is called funny because I don't know, you probably tell jokes in that one. I'm not sure. So it turns out when I was using sentence bird and some of these other methods and trying to apply, you know, relationship versus fitness versus funny, sentence bird is like, well, everything's funny. And so it was classifying everything as funny because these labels aren't mutually exclusive. Like things can be about politics and be funny, I think. So, and same with relationships, like funny things happen in relationships. And so a ton of things were getting classified as funny, which then made the overall accuracy go down. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And that makes sense. Like, because it is like similarity search, there is no one true answer. And if you're, if you're picking labels that have overlap or have potential overlap with the content that you're trying to classify, it makes sense that that might happen. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And also, like, what we're trying to do is extract, like, assign labels that capture this, like, semantic content of the sentences. And it's not necessarily the case that subreddits do that. Like, you know, getting posted in some subreddit has some, gen like, a different generative process to the sentence being written, <laughs> if you like. Um, so, you know, they're not necessarily like reliable labels. They're, they're reliable labels for which subreddit those those sentences yeah. came from, but they're not necessarily reliable labels for the actual content of the sentence. Exactly, right. Because yeah, you can have like a business joke in the funny subreddit, uh, but this content of the sentence is about business. Right, exactly. So like these things, again, there's tons of overlap. And, for that, and that's what, that's in addition to having lots of different subreddits to classify into, this nature of like user generated content that can be, you know, anything in any of these categories, right? Because it only takes very little uh, content in order to be like, yes, this is fine to post in this subreddit, even if it has a lot of different connotations. And, and so that's what makes this data set much more challenging um, to get exactly right. But really, on the other hand, it's not necessarily wrong either. Like the model is doing what we told it to do. It's labeling the funny stuff. And if you yeah. go through and look at all the things that are funny, you're like, yeah, that, well, probably. Probably all of the stuff is like, yeah, that's really funny, right? So it's, yeah, it's kind of fun. But if you want, if you're, if you are really, really need specific labels, then you need to put a little more care into what the label names are to try to get that separation, or you need to look at like, again, like the top three that are applicable to an article to get a better sense of, of how to categorize it. Cool. cool. Uh, well, I think we kind of need to wrap up now, but thanks everyone for coming to hang out. Uh, as promised, we have some raffle winners. Uh, yeah. So behind the scenes, we have a little Python tool that we run. Uh, and I am happy to announce that Dan Smith and Shruti Shah, you have won uh, $20 each to spend in the Cloud Store. Uh, do you tell us how those socks pan out or buy something else, but yeah, recommend the socks. Uh, okay. <laughs> we really do recommend the socks. <laughs> um, it's been fun hanging out with everyone. Uh, feel free to hit us up on Twitter anytime with follow-up questions and stuff. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>